Hello everybody and welcome. Hope you're doing marvellously well, as Warren would say. I I'm Adam Steele and this is the inaugural episode of a new podcast that I'm making called Behind Music Tech. Uh, it's long-form conversations with people in the industry, not just the producers, but also people who work at some of these big companies that make things like guitars, microphones, what actually goes on? Where did they come from? How did they get into it? What makes them tick? And it's something that I've been wanting to do for a long time because short interviews only can give you so much. Most of the time with businesses, they give you the kind of corporate and marketing, look at this new product, look at the history of the company from a kind of a you know, a, a scripted background. And I just wanted to take people's defenses down and ask them, okay, but what about you? The first episode is actually someone who is a producer, uh, but someone who works in the industry behind the scenes as well with the Cola Audio Cult. Therefore, we know that the person is Christian Kohler. He is a phenomenal metal producer and is someone who I have the extreme privilege to call my friend. And we were at an event recently called 42 Gear Street and I managed to sit him down in front of the camera for about half an hour to get his thoughts on where he came from, why he's got to where he has and why he's now doing the educational thing and kind of putting himself out there as well as just production. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Christian Cola. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Coffee with Cola. <laughs> no beer, no beer. It's, what is it? Half past 12. Yeah, it's not so beer o'clock yet. It's right? another half hour before we, yeah, right. <laughs> before we get started again. Yeah. But yes, um, I wanted to sit down with you and talk uh, at length about stuff that, that people might not know about you because kind of you've got this reputation in the industry as a metal legend and there's loads of bands you've worked with that gone on to be really kind of famous, if that's the, the right word. Mm. Uh, but beyond that, I don't know much about you, the person. I mean, what I know from having met you is you're really cool. Thank you. But that's it. That's all. You know that I like beer, right? That's true. And that's basically, that sums it up. We and can stop you, now. And that you leave sausages everywhere, I found. Right, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like yeah, that was not... I put some sausages into Henning's uh, fridge and I got punished for it. Yeah, He was angry. <laughs> he was angry, yeah. Um, what do you want to know? Like, so, I mean, have you always been a production guy? Did you start with something else and move in or have you just always been? Yeah, I, I think like I started like everybody else, like tried to become a rock star with your band. You right. know? But then pretty, pretty quickly, I realized like the whole studio thing inspires me a lot more than the live part right which is great as well uh, so i think when i was 17 or 18 i i decided i really wanted to have a home studio i wanted to dive in that production thing sure. not to, to 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 become a producer but that was just a lot of fun I started on like i thought maybe i was 16 started with a four track and then got my first eight at and then got my first console and then it's the same story like with many other producers then you record your own band and then suddenly the band in the rehearsal room next door shows up so it's like hey you got eight tracks let's make a demo uh, right and uh yeah and then it goes on so that uh yeah so you could, I, could, like, I could make some money are we talking like mid 90s this kind of yeah end of 90s maybe yeah 96 97 so yeah so i could make some money so each production like like brought the money in to buy whatever a compressor or a noise gate sure. or whatever I needed. And uh, and as I moved on, after a few years, I realized, oh, I have become much more of a producer than a musician. And um, and I was actually making money with it. And uh, so I've never done anything else. I've studied musicology, um, but uh, never worked in that in that field. Okay. So yeah, from, from when I was 19, that's when I started Cola Keller Studios until Maybe two years ago, I was only doing studio productions until the whole education and YouTube thing started, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how did that even happen? Were you producing somebody and they said, hey, you should do this? Or did someone approach you? Or? It was because of uh, URM Academy. So I did uh, what they call Nail the Mix 
So I mixed a band called uh, Aborted, a death metal band, American-Belgian band. And the guys from the URM Academy asked me to do Nail the Mix, which uh, you know is one of their... Yeah, where you explain exactly what you Exactly, doing. you show people how you mix the record. And I did that and and I remember being super nervous about that because, you know, I'm German, so I was like, I was going to, to Orlando to do that and I was totally insecure about, you know, if people want to, you know, watch me or listen to me explaining stuff, but turned out it was okay. And then the next step was that the URM guys asked me to do YouTube videos on their channel. And I said like, yeah, let's try this. I would have never started my own YouTube channel. Right. And I did that for a year or something, did like 10 or 15 videos, and it really grew the channel, like like doubled the size of the channel, I think to something like 70 or 80,000. And then I felt like, hey, maybe I should do my own thing. And now, almost two years ago, I started my own channel, like from, from nothing. And um, I'm very happy about uh, having done that. And I gotta say, yeah, now I'm doing both. I'm doing studio productions, but much less. Okay. I have two other guys working in my studio and a lot more like courses and, uh, and YouTube videos. And I'm working on my own academy, which is also something we could talk about. Oh yeah, yeah and, we'll like. but, but I, I'm, I'm really, really inspired by that, by that combination because YouTube and those courses open up a, a new dimension for me. Because as you know, um, um, as a producer, you know, you can't do a lot of experiments because you're on a tight schedule yeah. and, you know, you, so... Yeah, you, it's their money. You can't spend their money on screwing around with 10 microphones. Exactly. So you, you got to know what you do. You got to be fast. You got to be effective. You got to deal with people, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So there's not much space for checking out 15 different guitar speakers. But as you know, or if checking out, what was it, 150 guitar Something speakers stupid, yeah. in, in your case. Too many. Right. So, so now I can do... I have an excuse for doing all the nerdy stuff that you can't do in a real studio. And I yeah. got to say, I have learned a lot from my own YouTube videos. Maybe the same with you or with this? Yeah, absolutely. That I, a lot of, because I've, I've been doing production for the same time, almost the same time as you. You're a little older than me, but almost the same time. I was very young when I started. But for me, it was like, if I had a, a couple of days where no one was booked in, then I'd screw around with things. But I'm the kind of person who I, I always want to tell everybody about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of the people, while I'd be producing, were like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it sound good. Right. And I was kind of lucky that my other company that I worked with was Media Video. So um, my business partner says, hey, we have the cameras. You like to talk. Talk to the camera. Do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so that's how, kind of how it's, so for me, it's been a much more slow burn, but do you still find that that excitement of, of telling people about, Hey, I tried this and it's really kind of, I got this great idea. Is that I, something that yeah. I, I just, I just started doing this two years ago, but it's, so it's still there. It's still there. I don't know how long that's going to last, but I'm constantly getting inspired to do, to do cool shit both on YouTube, but also like the, the, in the Academy, that format gives me like a lot more space to do more complex projects. And I, I got so many ideas and I got, so, I'm, I'm super inspired still. Um, yeah. So what's that, uh, the, the Academy about? Because the, obviously there are lessons there, but beyond that. It's basically, it's called the Cola Audio Cult and it's based like around me. So I'm doing maybe 50% of the courses and of everything. And then we also have external mentors doing stuff. And it is about, yeah, producing heavy music from hard rock to extreme metal. And it's not only about mixing and mastering, it's also about recording, it's about uh, arranging, it's about making music. And um, like, like uh, I'm both doing like theoretical courses where I explain how to EQ a guitar, how to mic a snare drum, all that kind of stuff in the way how I explain things and with the experience that I have, but we're also doing just experimental stuff and interesting stuff. We have like one product that we call Cola Crusade, where I just go somewhere to do cool shit. For example, like two months ago, I went to this abandoned big swimming pool, public swimming pool, and we recorded drum samples and IRs there before that place was taken down by the bulldozers. Right. And we filmed the whole like, documentary about this where you see me. So you learn how to create IRs, you learn how to create drum samples. And, but you also see me going there, driving there and having a beer in the evening afterwards. And you see the whole process. Right. 
or like in the first month of the Academy in October, hopefully, um, we're releasing a documentary course about me going to Prague, Czech Republic, to a studio where we record a metal band or a hardcore band from the Netherlands, No Turning Back, live. Mm. Which is something you usually don't do. So, yeah. yeah. And a lot of people complain about metal sounding too sterile, too overproduced, whatever. So I said, like, let's try a live recording. Yeah. You know, let's see, you know, and so you can be a part, you can be like a fly on the wall on the on the whole process. And so it's and people get the multi-tracks. So to sum it up, there will be like uh, the courses, the theoretical courses. And there will be documentaries of me going somewhere. And oh, yeah, we've met in LA. So in LA, I've done a drum session at Sunset. I've been to Motorhead Studio doing some stuff there. So there will be a lot of uh, cool. And we might be doing something together very soon. Um, so I, I'm hope, I hope the Academy will be like three things. First, both entertaining and educational. Is that a word? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, educational. And I hope we can build, that's the third thing, I hope we can build a great community. Yeah. Like of, of, of people trying to, I call it think outside of the box, because I, I don't want to tell people to, to copy what I'm doing or to try to sound like me or try to sound like anybody else. Yeah. I just want to inspire people to give them the, the right tools to sound, to find their own tones, find their own sound yeah. and think outside of the box. And uh, uh, you don't even have to like what I'm doing, I'm just giving you the tools to, you know, do something better. That's perfect. I mean, the, so the community thing's really big. I mean, the way yeah. the, the way that I learned how I, my sound, so to speak, is like that, that. I'd be like, I like what this guy's doing. I like what this guy's doing. But before YouTube, a lot of it was guesswork. Mm, yeah. And you'd be like, I think that guy's doing this. I think that guy's doing this. Do you think, uh, it, is it a problem these days that some of the younger engineers, they want to sound exactly like another guy. Mm. And then you've got a thousand clones of the same person. Yeah, that's that's a problem. And that's exactly what I'm trying to address. So like I'm, I'm, I'm showing stuff and you can try to copy that. But the main idea should be to use DAS, that as a starting point to find your own way, you know, just do something else. And that's what I do in my YouTube videos as well. I'm just trying stuff and sometimes I fail. Sometimes I, and I'm, I'm showing like the whole process. So back in the days, it took us way longer to understand stuff, to learn stuff, and it wasn't better, you know? No. I always tell that story, like in the beginning, uh, everybody was talking, like in, in the German studio magazines, they were talking about using room mics on guitars. Mm. So I've, but of course, they weren't not talking about heavy metal rhythm guitars. So it took me half a year to find out that, you know, room mics suck on, on metal guitars. Yeah. But I, I just thought like there's something wrong. Maybe my room, maybe my mics, maybe the miking technique, you know, took me forever. Yeah. Today you can just Google that in five seconds and find out, don't, you know, don't even bother with room mics. You don't need that. Yeah. So that is great that you can get all this kind of information. On the other hand, like the, 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 the other side is that people tend to uh, become lazy and tend to use presets and tend to, you know, that's, and that's something I want to change because I think uh, um, the next generation of engineers, of producers, um, um, you know, the, the great ones will be the ones that break the rules again yeah. and don't try to sound like you or me or any whatever famous producer. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm trying to inspire people to, you, I mean, you've got to learn the basics, that's important, yes. but then you've got to learn the rules and then you, in order to break them. Yeah, I think one of the, the things that, that I say to the younger engineers is, why are you doing that? Not to tell them off or to ask them like to doubt themselves, but yeah. just if they could, I think if they can explain why they're doing something, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Because then even if it doesn't sound like everybody else, if they're like, well, I wanted to, to do this thing, perfect. Yeah. And that's how we get new character. Right. Character is the word because I think these days it's at least in the in the in the metal world it's not so much about sounding good anymore. We've been there, everybody's there, and it's very easy compared to back in the days to just whatever get some tune track samples and some camper profiles and or some amp sims and just sound decent. Yeah, I mean mixing is still like a, something you really got to learn, but you know you can sound decent pretty easily. So it's not anymore about that. These days, like one of my most successful videos was like blending a tight distortion with fuzz pedals, which is something you normally don't do in metal. But that is 
that was an inspiration to a lot of people. Mm. And I got so much feedback from people like, oh, no, I'm trying, like, I'm, you know, I'm going into a totally different direction. Does it sound better? No. But it sounds cool. Dif right, different, yeah. like, like, you know, nasty, whatever. And so that, of course, led to shameless plug, the grindstein pedal. Right. right. No, that was actually, uh, that was the HM2 thing. Like, like, that was not really, yeah, but that's basically okay, the same, a, a same yeah, similar idea to just, yeah, just find a way of, of taming that HM2 sound, make it more usable. And um, yeah, and that also like, it's, it's so cool to see people bo using both the Grindstein pedal and um, the software. I just talked to Andy Sneep. So he used the Grindstein pedal on the new Amon Amath record. Nice. Right, like, blend, like not the main tone, but blended so, with whatever, a 5150 or something. You know? sure. He got back to me, sent me uh, like his settings. And it's like, how cool is that? Yeah. You know, do we have Andy Sneep? But the man who can literally have and do anything he wants. Right. And he just bought the pedal, you know? So we just like, what, is that, is that him? Yeah, that's him. And, but it's not only him, it's like hundreds of people or thousands of people who used the plugin and the, um, and the pedal to, to, to experiment, to do crazy shit. And that's how it, that's how tools should be used, right? Absolutely. I, I like to take a really good tool and just do something a little different. I mean, as a bass player first as mm. well. I'm like, wow. ooh, grindstein pedal on bass. And everyone's like, that's not going to sound good. Who knows? So. <laughs> Who knows? Exactly. It's going to sound fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> If you're listening to this as an MP3, there is a video version on my channel, that's Adam Steele. And if you're watching this as a video, there is an MP3 version, which is on the Produce Like a Pro podcast. So have a look either way and have a look on the Produce Like a Pro channel for more of this kind of stuff. On with the show. Talking about Sneep, for the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, he was the guy that everybody was like, I want to sound like him. Yeah. And now we've got a new, we've got Nolly, everybody wants to sound like him. And now we've got Zach Savini doing stuff like Architect, and people want to sound like him. Why do people gravitate towards the, the one guy and the kind of the superstar instead of kind of going, I like this, I like that, I like this? I mean, it's not bad if you have your superstar. And I think that's what Nolly did as well. So he's a huge. Andy Sneap fan, right? And he was like, he's still trying to figure out like, with all his cabs and the V30s and try, or maybe now he has found out, but he's, he spent a lot of time finding out how to get those guitar tones from back, like the Andy Sneap guitar tones from the early 2000s. And, and that is totally fine as long as you move on. So, yeah. so you got to do your homework. You got to learn how to do things. And it's not bad in the beginning to try to, whatever, even copy something. But at a certain point, once you've learned it, you you gotta you gotta move on and i can just say like for 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 my academy because i'm talking to a lot of different mentors i'm ta talking to like old school people new school people mm. and we're gonna have a lot of really inspiring people there and that is the key word inspiring so i'm not really looking for for the most famous guy right now you know the hippest guy who just mixed the most the best selling metal record of last year or something i'm looking for sometimes i found some people that are not famous at all but they just do cool shit, you know, that's and that's right. And that's what, what we want. I want to inspire people, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Here's a good question for you for a long form thing. Have you got like one or two or just a few favorite say, guitar sounds that just for you are, I go for this, this is where I begin. Mm. That, that are not necessarily, you know, the, the typical OPV5150 Tube mm. Screamer. Mm. Something a little weird. Weird, like. yeah. Well, good weird. Good weird. Um, yeah, I'm actually, like lately, well, I, oh, there's a lot. I mean, I have a lot of different tube amps. I have a lot of pedals and I try not to repeat myself that much. Mm. I'm also using the Kemper and I have a lot of, I only, I'm only using my own Kemper profiles, but I'm trying to avoid that. So whenever I have the time, I will use the real thing, mm. not because it's necessarily better, but because it inspires me more and it will always sound a little different. And like the, tr I think my two most typical traditional tones would be a rectifier. Uh, that 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 scoop rectifier tone is something I really love. I love the low end of a rectifier, um, and also orange amplifiers, which sound totally different. Different kind of distortion feels much more creamy and slower. I also like those would I think those would be my two desert island amps, just like the rectifier and the orange, and I can blend them and combine them and can go from whatever, from here to here, and do uh, cover a lot of different tones with them. Hmm. And lately, 
I've, I'm, I'm trying to get more and more dirty, which means I'm using more and more transistor distortion, like metal zone even, sometimes mm. blended with something. The red pedal, I just checked out the new one, the new red from TC Electronic, which also sounds great. HM2, obviously, and different fuzz pedals blended with, um, with distortion tones. So blending things is like opens up a new, whole new world of tones. So that's what I do a lot at the moment. So you start with whatever, your 5150 tone or your rectifier tone, sure. tight modern tone, and then you try to blend in something really nasty or dirty. And uh, that's also something I'm, I'm, I'm showing in, in one of my courses. It's just how to, you know, combine things. Yeah. You know, and sometimes it's also like, you, you never know what's going to happen. Sometimes it's not always mm. like planned. Yeah. You know, sometimes things just happen. Yeah, some of uh, it depends on the band, depends on the player. Yeah. But sometimes you just, I mean, everybody knows that. Like, like, like somebody kicks a mic and suddenly things sound better and it wasn't planned. Or you're, you realize you're on the wrong channel, but it actually sounds good. And yeah. those are like the accidents that happen. And uh, so, um, yeah, that's, that's another thing that's important. It's good to have a plan. It's good to have a vision. But then uh, realizing that, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can break the rules somewhere, you know, that, that's also important that if you, you expect to use whatever, the rectifier, because you feel that's, that's where I want to go. And along the way, you realize, wait a minute, the clean channel of the rectifier, to go, you, you just find yeah, something yeah. and then it's, cool. yeah, then go for it. Whatever sounds great. Mm. Mm. Do you ever get kind of a pushback if a band says I want to work with you and then you start the session and then they say oh no we want to do it this way or do they yeah. usually just trust I mean it gets the, the more you have done and the more famous you are uh, the less problems you usually get because people know why they are coming and I try also to talk to them try to find out what they want so I'm not having a lot of problems with with um, like like a lot of conflicts with bands and stuff but yeah, everybody has been to, has worked on projects where people just like what they call revision hell or something, yeah. where people just go crazy. But I have learned to like, like one, one important thing is like, if you make a mix for a band um, and then you get a feedback saying like, yeah, we, the guitar tone should be different, the drums and we don't like the overall blah and blah, 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 blah. We get a long list, um, but you are satisfied with the direction of your mix and you get that kind of feedback, then stop the project. Right. Right, because uh, if you can afford it, of course. Yeah. I know not everybody can do that, but um, if you are too far away from, like if your vision or is too far away from the vision of the, the artist, it's always gonna end up in a foul compromise kind of thing where everybody is not, not happy. Yeah. So um, that is important. But um, the more you talk to people and the more you make them explain what they really want, the better it is. Yeah. You know, you want references, you want to ask questions, and the more you know, um, yeah, the better the chances are that you, that, you, that you get a feedback like, hey, it sounds great, kick drum could be a little louder and less reverb on the vocals. Boom, you know? Yeah. Something, I've, I think I was talking to Scott Elliott about this yesterday, that mm. I think for me, the most important thing in working with a band now of all the stages is pre-production, mm. where you, you sit down with them and go, okay, what do you actually want? Why do you want that? Yeah. Is that something you found more and more as you've Yeah, the, the problem these days is, I think maybe that's also one of Scott's problem maybe, is that people, if you're just mixing a record um, and you don't record anything, then, uh, and, and these days, like people send you whatever, MIDI drums, DI tracks, yeah. and, and, and a vocal track. And uh, that means when you open it up and play it, you hear basically nothing. Maybe a piano playing your drums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then you hear the DI tracks. So that means uh, they give away all the decisions to you. And that is, that is very, very difficult. And that is very prone to like to, um, it's pre-programmed that, you, that you're gonna have conflicts and problems. So back in the days, you used to um, go through an entire production and you would you know, do a guitar sound check, do a bass sound check. So all the decisions are spread out throughout the entire production process. And these days you have to make all those decisions the first day you start mixing. You know, you have to choose yeah. a kick drum, a snare drum, uh, whatever, you have to reamp the guitars, reamp the bass, and that is a problem. So I always try to encourage people, even if I'm reamping the guitars, I always tell them, please try to send me a guitar tone that you like. Right. I'll try to use it, 
But if not, then I actually then I know where you want to go, right? Yes. Yeah, so you're and, just getting a nice right. version of their idea. Exactly. And if you if you if we record the drums, that that is fine. I'm always prefer having like not not no MIDI drums. But if it's programmed drums, then also send me audio signals. You know, yeah. you should have a, it's your band. You know, you should you should have a vision how you want to sound, and then I can I can tweak I can fine tune it. But you know. Um, nothing more boring than having just the eye tracks and, and, and midi drums and i think that's uh scott is doing that a lot like so uh, you know like it's, mixing yeah well especially the last couple of years with the whole covid and lockdown thing yeah I found that too that i think i've recorded one band in the last two years oh, in, wow. in person yeah <laughs> because of that because right we were all we couldn't up until now couldn't see each other so it's become much more normal yeah i think so bands they think oh i can record this at home so I mean, that's that's maybe another question is if if a band is recording at home say they have to budget restraints whatever yeah, it is yeah. and they go and send that to you what would you say to them is is the first thing to consider um like for guitar recording just the whole thing if they're recording is talk about the, yeah. the styles the tones talk to them before they record yeah talk to them before they record um make them send you snippets of whatever they record so you don't end up with 15 songs of distorted di tracks or noisy di tracks right. so we got the technical side that's like one thing uh just to make sure the tracks are all right and that should be checked before like i said before you record 15 songs um but then it's always very very important to have um if, if you're recording yourself, you need to be able to step back and see the whole picture. Mm. Or maybe somebody else in the band can do that for you. So being a, an artist and a producer at the same time is very difficult for a lot of people. Yeah. So you know that someone like you and me, you, we listen to a track and so like, it's out of tune. And you know, it's yeah. it's all wrong. Well, how, how could you not hear that? You're a pretty good guitar player. How could you not hear that? Yes. They because so because they were right, right they were they, they were focus. doing yeah. they were doing two jobs at once and yeah. that was too much for them so make sure you really you really review your own work yeah and um or have somebody else in the band or whatever yeah it still makes sense to work with a producer it doesn't have to be me but to have another instance and you know yeah. just to control things so you can so you can you so you can focus and concentrate on your job which is playing yes yeah. i definitely get the best performances out of people when they're not thinking about anything yeah. other than right playing yeah, yeah the, there are only a few people i know who can genuinely concentrate on the recording and yeah that, i mean guys like carl sanders from nile but yeah. he gets so much experience that he's brutal with himself he's like that was a little out of tune i will do it 10 times until it's perfect yeah but he has the experience to play it back and hear that and focus and same with john brown mm. but even with brown i helped him with the, the last album to get the tones yeah. it sounds because he could just play right and i could change all the tones and then he could say to me i i need a little more of this a little less of that and but it just feels playing. better even yeah. like like i mean i know a lot of bands like bigger bands who say like of course i could record my 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 guitar track at home but why should i yeah i like the comfort of having someone you know so i don't have to concentrate on several things yeah and um I also just worked with Carl Sanders, by the way. I just reamped oh, yeah. uh, one of his solos, and uh, such a great guy. Yeah, um, yeah. But I agree, there are not many. But on the other hand, it has become a lot better. Yeah. Compared to ten years ago, um, people have learned a lot more how to record the eye tracks. What is that noise? I think it's something. Oh, that's the pool, up. right? The whirlpool. Yeah. Okay. It's fine. It's, it's fine. Good old Isotope RX. Mm one of our biggest tools <laughs> fix all the problems <laughs> yeah. right that's right rx yeah maybe one last question to round things out and is if if you are kind of if you're a guitarist and you are recording at home what's the most important thing that you would say that they should have in terms of the gear technically right? yeah, yeah. Te i mean um people record the eye tracks at home assuming you are recording the eye tracks the most important thing is to have the cleanest signal chain possible because what you need to understand is that any reamped guitar tone, especially if you go through like real analog gear, will sound, let's say, worse and more noisy than recording straight into an amp because yeah. you go through whatever, a DI box, a mic pre, a converter, and all those um, 
different devices will add noise that you don't hear on the DI track itself. But yeah. once you play it back through, you know, a, a tube amp, a crank tube amp, you will hear every fucking detail. And you can, you know, you can even hear your neighbor, whatever, turning on his, yes. his TV or his, his laptop or something. Mm -hmm. So um, you got to make sure you have the shortest and cleanest signal path possible. So a high quality DI box or high Z um, yeah. input and... Uh, I get I get this feedback from people. It's like why why should I spend money on a DI box? It sounds the same to me. Right. And it's like yeah, it sounds the same to you because it just sounds like a dry DI track. Right. You're not putting it through 100 dB of gain. Exactly. And that's and that that is a difference. So and that again depends on which pickups you use. So I'm yeah. I'm mostly using active pickups. That's why I'm using a passive DI that okay. works great. And but your both your recording signal path and also your reamping signal path, if you're using analog. Yeah, 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 I mean, a lot of people use plugins. Um, is crucial, crucial because any device will, yeah, will be will become audible later. Yeah, so every that little thing becomes a thousand times louder. Yeah, right. Because exactly. that's DBs, kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there we go. So, so just in in closing, uh, where do people find the Cola Audio Cult? Uh, it's it's gonna be colaaudiocult.com very soon. In the meantime, we're going to launch it. The plan is to launch it in October with a lot of different courses. Can't talk about the other mentors right now, but we got some very cool people doing courses for us. I'm doing that live recording course in the first month. You're getting a lot of other uh, courses and uh, it's going to be nothing but fantastic. <laughs> um, in the meantime, you can check out my YouTube channel, which um, is called Cola Keller Studio. And, uh, but I think that one will also be called Cola Audio Cult. Soon, right? Okay. When, when we launch the cult, I will. I think I will rename. Make, makes sense. And um, yeah, if you want to learn something about making metal sound evil again, join the cult. <laughs> and so there you have it, Christian Kohler. What a great person, and I really look forward to seeing what more we do with the Kohler Audio Cult. And I'm looking forward to seeing more of his productions and videos in the future. Check out his video channel the cola keller studio a link will be down in the description for the youtube video and if you're listening to this on mp3 just check out christian with a k cola k-o-h-l-e thanks everybody next time on the behind up music tech podcast we're going to be talking to a very interesting german man called uh, christian better known as chris jupiter from jupiter effects he makes these weird and wonderful effects pedals, and he's just a really nice person. And that seems to be a common theme in this industry, so we'll see what makes him tick next time. I'll see you then. Bye, everybody.